You're listening to 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College in Garden City, New York. I'm Bill McIntyre here with John Gallo for another edition of this week's Long Island News, the news show that brings you news stories about Long Island and about Long Islanders. And now we're delighted to be joined for the first time by Catherine Rinaldi, following her uh, becoming the interim president of the Long Island Railroad in February of this year, uh, after her predecessor, Philip Ng, retired. Now, before leading the LIRR, she served as president of the MTA Metro North Railroad since February of 2018, a role that she continues in now. Mm -hmm. So... uh, (laughs) I said it off the radio, but I was just talking about how full your plate is. Um, you, you know, you, these are two giant uh, entities. They are. They are, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, and, and before we really get started in things, you know what? When we had, I had mentioned to somebody that we were actually going to get to talk to you on the, on the radio, the first thing that every common person wants to know is, um, are you getting paid for both jobs? <laughs> no, they did not double my pay. It just doesn't work that way. No, but, no uh, huh? okay. They I'm doubled the responsibility, not double the pay. So there well, you go. They, but, they also um, double the glory, though. Well, <laughs> double it. well, I hope so, right? I hope it's double the glory. I hope it turns out to be that way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, but yeah. It's, listen, it's a great honor. I mean, it's it's. I, I grew up on Long Island. Um, mm-hmm. So I grew up taking the Long Island Railroad into the city. So that was that was the, that was the system I grew up with. So to right. be at the head of it, you know, it's it's really a, a tremendous honor. Yeah. Uh, and I had I had worked at Long Island about ten years ago. So um, and so it was really nice to come back. You know, a lot of the same people. It felt very familiar when I started back in February. So it's 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 good. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's really an honor to be in, in the position to be able to lead both agencies. Does it give you a different, uh, a totally different vantage? I mean, you're at a different vantage point because you get to oversee a large portion of all of the train, uh, you know, uh, things that are going on here. Uh, Does that help you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in common between, I mean, they're, they're, you know, the first and second largest, you know, commuter railroads in the country. So, uh, you know, there's a lot that they can learn from each other, you know, to be kind of, you know, looking at both. It really is the opportunity to sort of see what one agency might be doing better than the other or different than the other, share best practices, mm-hmm. you know, just try to understand, you know, where there might be, you know, opportunities to, to learn from each other. Right. So, so you know, that it, it's, it's kind of a rare opportunity to be able to have that kind of cross pollination. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, just starting to do a little bit of that now, but it's been, it's been, it's been great. I've gotten a lot of support. I've got great teams on both sides to support me. So I'm very lucky. Wow. Of course. And uh, like uh, Bill was uh, saying before, you have obviously an extensive career uh both uh, with both transit agencies and yeah. with mta uh yeah. itself mm-hmm. uh and you know the fact is that there's a lot of uh, different goals i'm sure for both uh rail lines and for the uh customers and and the ridership so h- how are you going about managing those i know for here on Long island uh, some of the most particular ones that uh, people are concerned about are the third track project sure. uh, the expansion of course and, um, you know, entering into Grand Central be, uh, by LIRR. So right. those I know are the main priorities of over here. Um, but I'm sure there's some other big priorities uh, over, again, on Metro North. So how do those get balanced in terms of having to negotiate for both parties, I guess, the Long Islanders and the folks yeah, you know, kind of Westchester North? Thanks. Well, but I think part of the reason why I'm actually in this combined role is because of the Eastside Access Project. Um, so the Eastside Access Project, you know, is scheduled to start at the end of this year. It's going to bring Long Island Railroad service into Grand Central, uh, you know, a, a lower concourse below the existing Grand Central Terminal. Um, so it really knits the two railroads together in a way that's really unprecedented. Um, you know, my Metro North staff has responsibility for the customer experience within Grand Central, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, now my Long Island staff will will be involved in terms of delivering service to Grand Central for the very first time. So there's a lot that we can learn from each other with respect to the operations in the terminal, but it also, you know, I've been saying this and, and, um, And I don't know that people think about this project in this way. Um, It provides a lot of opportunities for people to take both systems, right? So so I grew up in Huntington. My parents live in Huntington. I live in Westchester County. I never take the train to see them, right? I mean, I could take the train to Grand Central that I'd have to get over to Penn. And by the time I do all of that, you know, it's just quicker to drive. So I never take the train to see them. It's very rare. Um, But, you know, now it will be so easy, right? I would take the train to Grand Central, go down the escalator, and there would be, you know, a waiting train for me to go to Huntington. 
or if I want to take my family to Long Beach in the summer, or if I want to, you know, all of these Long Island destinations are much, much more accessible for the Metro North customers. And conversely, the Metro North destinations are way more accessible to the Long Island customers. So you can get a job in White Plains, you can get a job in the Bronx, you know, all these, you know, all of this connectivity between the Metro North system and the Long Island system provides a lot of opportunities for for leisure travel, for, for work opportunities. It just knits the systems together in a way that just doesn't exist right now. So I think it's really, really exciting uh, for customers of both railroads that this thing is going to go live in a few months. Mm. Oh, yeah, of course. I certainly have family members who uh, live up in Orange County and, you know, born and raised on Long Island. Uh, their families are up there now, but love to go to Islanders games. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, absolutely. New, uh, arena. Obviously, there's a lovely new uh, station there, of course, as well. So knowing that, like you said, um, you know, can get to work and bring the whole family down to Jones Beach or something like that, maybe right. uh, in the future from, you know, up in, in the northern counties. Uh, that sounds like a great thing, of course. So that uh, is important. And I know you touched on a couple of other important uh, issues uh, right there. But, you know, one of the main ones, too, throughout this whole process, you know, talking with your predecessor, Phil Ang, talking with uh, the beat reporters who cover, obviously, transit is the ridership uh, rate, yeah, uh, obviously, obviously the pandemic through now. So where do we kind of stand? I know it's kind of, you know, ebbed and flowed and been moving back up, mm-hmm. but every time it seems that we get a new variant, sub-variant, you know, it kind of becomes a little fluctuation. So where are things from your perspective at the moment? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely looking at the glass as half full. So, you know, we were doing well in the fall and then we hit a bit of a speed bump because of Omicron. So Omicron kind of hit mid-December into January. Um, you know, we were set back a bit. I mean, not nearly as bad as it was at the beginning of the pandemic, but we were definitely set back a bit. Back a bit. Um, but the ridership really since February has been um, has been growing really very nicely um, during the week. Um, so we're now at roughly 60 percent of our pre-COVID ridership. So if you think that at one point, you know, Long Island was at 5 percent of its pre-COVID ridership. I mean, that's really a very nice recovery that we've seen in the early months of this year since Omicron started to uh, recede a bit. And uh, we continue to grow. I mean, we've got this kind of like mini wave happening now with one of these sub variants, which I can't keep track of. Um, but ridership during the week actually remains pretty good, especially Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, you know, I think the return to work patterns are still a little bit in a state of flux. People tend to take longer weekends. So ridership tends to be a little bit quieter on Mondays and Fridays. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're, you know, we're seeing pretty good ridership. And then the weekends have been strong throughout. That, that's that been sort of the, the bright spot and the, the, the sort of surprising good story about sort of the pandemic ridership is that discretionary ridership on the weekends is has been pretty strong and and that continues to be the case this spring yeah and i know the city ticket uh for folks who are just on the other side yeah. of the border i know that's a, a great uh tool yeah. i know the price came down on that i certainly make advantage of that when i'm uh, in the city and needing to move mm-hmm. around uh, that way and i know there's a lot of uh, incentives and uh, other types of uh discount programs that are trying yep. to entice people back onto the rails so right. how do we see those kind of going uh do we see you know i know it's only been some time since they've been rolled out but are we starting to see a little bit of positive impact of maybe more people using them? I know it's hard that causation versus correlation, but do they seem to be uh, bearing out? Yeah. So, so, so the big one, I, th- I mean, there's a discount on the monthly ticket, but the, the, the new thing that we have is this, this 20 trip ticket. So a 20 trip, peak ticket um, to yeah, sort of yeah. kind of appeal to those former monthly customers who may not be coming in five days a week, right. um, but maybe sort of hybrid coming in two, three days a week. Uh, so we've had a nice take up on the on the 20 trip ticket um, to try to, you know, lure those people. It, you know, it's a 20 percent discount. It's a it's 20 trip ticket, peak ticket. So it's 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 been uh, it's been a popular, you know, fair product for, for the customers who are back to work, but maybe not working the way that they had been before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, that that's another point, mm-hmm. you know, knowing that, you know, there's a lot of global and social complexities at play here out of the control, of course, of any agency or any uh, yeah. elected office agency, et cetera. Um, but, but the fact is that, you know, a lot of folks still haven't returned to work. So how is, you know, that kind of um, going in, in terms of LIRR's, I guess, efforts to uh, maybe work with businesses or is, is there any real way that, you know, that can be kind of spurred on more uh, by LIRR um, and I guess MTA as a whole, or is it really just on the employers when it comes to that? Well, I mean, you know, MTA and, and, and Long Island, I mean, Long Island Railroad is part of the MTA. So there's been a lot of back and forth with the business community in terms of advocacy for people to try to get back to work, right, to come back to their offices. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I was at a, I was at a, an event up in Westchester for the real estate industry, um, you know, maybe about two weeks ago now. And, you know, people are just traveling differently. But, you know, you mentioned third track a little while ago. One of the benefits of that project is the reverse commute. 
So, you know, to the extent that people now are not necessarily working in the city, but are working at, uh, you know, uh, you know, employment locations on Long Island, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is going to create the opportunity for people who, you know, are working differently, uh, you know, at Long Island places of employment to actually take the Long Island Railroad to work. So, you know, that that's something that Metro North has had for some time. Metro North has had a good reverse commute because of just the infrastructure there and the fact that there are employment uh, centers in Stanford and White Plains and New Rochelle and some other places. And now this is really the kind of the, the key to being able to have that sort of a reverse commute on Long Island, too. Hmm. So it's, okay. it's I think we're just trying to think about different ways uh, to 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 entice people to take Long Island that are not necessarily just commuters going into the city, right? You know, we want yeah, people, right. to your point about city ticket, people who are riding to intermediate stations, people who are reverse commuters, people who are, you know, riding on the weekends. We, you know, we need to appeal to all of those people mm-hmm. and let them know that the, that the railroad is the best way to get around. Yeah, this would have yeah. been, this wouldn't, uh, I mean, in, in the look of it, it wouldn't have been a good thing if the idea of, um, you know, staying home and working had really caught on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because people do ask a company like Google says, we, we want all our employees back and, and people collectively ask why, why would you yeah. pay rent on a big building like that? Why would you, but we did see, uh, the unintended consequences of people not going to work in the city. A lot of the mom and pop shops that service right, the right, lunches. Absolutely. And I mean, it just, it, it just rattled its way right down the line, uh, how it affected so many people. I was curious though. And, and. Does the railroad system have, I mean, is there any way that they may possibly put pressure on businesses to get people to come back simply because the ridership was slipping a bit? Well, I don't know what pressure we can make. Exactly. You know, I think, I, yeah. I, it's, it's, we're not really in a position of a pressure, but certainly right. to, to to try to find our, meet our customers where they are right now, right? right. By, by, you know, to, to John's point, you know, offering different kinds of tickets, mm-hmm. offering different kinds of service, you know, beefing up that reverse commute when, when you know, third track goes live, right. having that connectivity with, with Metro North and with New York City Transit at Grand Central. So, you know, we want to provide a safe, reliable service uh, that gets people where they need to go, whatever the reason. Whatever right? they do, I mean, right. The reasons right. may have changed and the frequency may have changed, but, you know, right. the basics don't change ever. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I think and, years and these ag- new, and, Yeah, and yeah. these new projects, I think, provide those new opportunities to attract new people potentially to the, right. to the railroad. And years ago, when, when I took the railroad, I commuted for 10 years. And I tell you what, I used to bristle a little bit when people complained about the railroad. Because I say, you do this every day. Now, <laughs> one time last year, we had a problem. And that's yeah. all you talk about. Yeah. How about the other 364 days where everything, you know, yeah, it's, it's the old seems- story. You, know, you do everything right. Nobody's going to say a word. You do one thing wrong, exactly. you're going to hear a chorus. Yeah. Well, this is also the opportunity to give a shout out to the great workforce of Long Island. I mean, they the, the Long Island Railroad workforce, like they bring it every single day. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, storms and snow, you know, weather and hurricanes and, and whatever. And, yeah. you know, they leave their families and they come to work. And, uh, you know, they're, they're dedicated. They work hard. They work safely. And I just am really proud to lead that organization. Yeah, but yeah. look, the way that Long Island Definitely. is shaping up, the railroad is going to be a linchpin, uh, you know, it, in the future, no it, in the next yeah. few decades. Uh, no uh, question. Yeah, it, it's a driver it, of the economic. It's a driver of the economy, and you know, as the recovery you know continues from the pandemic, you know, the the railroad is going to be you know front and center in terms of driving the region's recovery, and we're, we you know we, we take that responsibility really seriously. Right. Of course, I know a lot of talk about bridge and tunnel communities, but we certainly are a, a rail commuter communities uh, out here on you know Nassau and Suffolk. Uh, myself, I take the uh, LIRR every day on the Port Washington line, tend to take my electric bike uh, and, you know, foldable and it goes on the train and it's a great way to commute. Good for the environment. Save some money on gas, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people can uh, appreciate oh, right now. So it might yeah. be something people want to consider. Uh, let's just remind our listeners that they are uh, listening to this week's Long Island News here on 90.3 WHPC, the radio voice of Nassau Community College with Bill McIntyre, myself, John Gallo. And thankfully joined by Catherine Rinaldi, uh, the Long Island Railroad's president uh, currently uh, serving as, as well as uh, the president of Metro North uh, Railroad System. So uh, just in the few moments that we have you uh, with us still, uh, Ms. Rinaldi, I guess other things, um, you know, that, that are, you know, related to what we're talking about here is Long Island's uh, LIRR's financial health. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I know that there's been a lot of injection of federal funding, of course. We've talked to federal legislators, uh, we've talked to state legislators as well. I mean, the budget, you know, has some funding as well for MTA and LIRR. So what is, what are your thoughts? Uh, I got to guess where we're at. I know some of that COVID money like CARES Act, you know, that might not be something long-term going forward. Uh, but, but where do we stand, I guess, um, 
kind of big picture. Uh, I know there's a lot, a lot of moving pieces to it, though, on the financial uh, status of the agency. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked about it a little bit. I mean, there are some uh, projections with respect to how fast ridership is going to come back. McKinsey had done some work for for MTA about two years ago. Uh, MTA is in the process of refreshing some of that work just to kind of make it, you know, come up with an estimate with respect to how quickly we expect to see riders back. Um, you know, I, I think there's two parts to your question. I think number one, we want to attract as many people back to the system as possible, both old riders and, and potentially new people, uh, because you know that that's you know that that's really key to the financial health is building ridership back up. Um, and course, you know, so that's obviously, mm-hmm. you know, a very important tool in all of this. Um, but I think, you know, also finding efficiencies. How can we, how can we work more efficiently? Are there savings opportunities? Are there things that we can do more efficiently than we have historically? I mean, you know, this is all public money and we have a responsibility to spend it wisely. So I think that those are, you know, obviously going to be the two linchpins to, to, you know, coming through this and, and, and you know, uh, coming out on the other side, you know, fiscally sound. Of course, because um, I know a lot of times, you know, readers, they hear about these stories of um, whether it's overtime kind of yeah, sure, you know of numbers that, that don't look good. And I know there was another issue with, uh, I think, the uh, Kronos time clock. There was like a ransomware attack that happened uh, previously, um, not under your administration. But just these things that people hear and, 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 and I know people get concerned by. But, but overall, you'd say that, again, considering the pandemic, considering the ridership, it's at a reasonable place. And, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it's something that you know, needs to be in any way, uh, you know, talked about in, in terms of, you know, restructure or anything like that, of oh, course, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think at this point, as, as I said, I mean, you know, as I sit here in May of 2022, you know, we're happy with what we're seeing with respect to the returning mm-hmm. ridership. You know, we, we've seen nice growth over the course of the last four or five months. Um, you know, things will probably slow down a little bit in the summer because people take vacations and, and you know, we, things might flatten out a little bit in the summer. Um, but we're looking forward to, you know, a good rest of the spring and a good fall. And, and hopefully more and more people will come back. And, you know, God willing, this pandemic will be behind us and, you know, we'll sort of see what the future holds. Yeah, yeah. amen to that. Um, and we know a large part of, um, you know, the present and the future, um, and it did catch some ire um, locally on Long Island, is that transit oriented development process where, you know, it, yeah. it generally would seem as innocuous, um, you know, particularly in areas. I know there was, uh, I think, in Lindbrook, uh, where it looks like a, a, a basically some kind of industrial property had been transitioned into housing near the rail line and trying to build, you know, these kind of downtown urban centers, uh, yeah. you know, wine dench, et cetera. So what are you, what were your thoughts on, on just seeing kind of the backlash? I know we got kind of uh, muddied the waters because it was an ADU issue along with transit oriented development. But but what, what are your thoughts, I guess, now that, uh, you know, you're involved with LIRR on that? So, so the, the 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 most recent one is at West, is Westbury Station, and uh, mm-hmm. you know that was just announced uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. So, so listen, I mean, I, I grew again. I grew up on Long Island. I, I, I you know, w- working where I work, I'm a big proponent of TOD, right? Because it's part of what we've been discussing. You know, put it, you know, walkable communities accessible to transit, encouraging more people to take the railroads where they need to go. Um, so, you know, and also, you know, unlocking the value of some of our property to the extent that it can be used in support of, of, of these developments. Uh, you know, listen, I mean, there's a lot, there, there's, a, this has been an area where Metro North has done quite a bit and now Long Island is, is doing a bit. Uh, and and uh, I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of it only because I think it does create opportunities for that kind of connectivity. There's obviously, you know, environmental benefits to getting people out of their cars and on the trains. So, um, you know, uh, the community issues need to be worked through, obviously, you know, at the community level. But, you know, as a, as a transportation professional, I think that, you know, well thought out developments proximate to our stations, I'm, I'm certainly in support of that. Okay, fair enough. And uh, to that point, you know, uh, engaging with the community, I know that you have a a long uh, track record, I guess, pun intended on, you know, focusing on uh, specifically, you know, that type of uh, situation with the tracks program. I know you held an informal customer forum. Yeah, uh, we were in Hicksville. It was was freezing. It was freezing. We were out there, you know, you have these things at the end of April, you think it's going to be 65 degrees. It was like 35 (laughs) degrees and windy and freezing cold, but it was great because people stop by and they tell you, you know, they tell you very specific stuff about their train, right? Like, you know, why, yep. why didn't you bring this train back? Or, you know, you mm-hmm. get really granular information about people's, you know, commuting experience. And that's the only way you're going to be able to improve is by hearing people, you know, having these one-on-one conversations about what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. You know, mm-hmm. you bring people back one by one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Having people have good experiences and having a, a format, uh, a venue. You know, I know um, you work, of course, with elected officials' offices, and I'm yep. sure that they tell you what their constituents say Absolutely. and concerned about. And I know you have folks who, uh, who deal with the community affairs side and, uh, you know, seeing someone like yourself uh, directly there, you know, I'm sure that instills confidence that this isn't someone 
you know, distant from the actual situation. I know whenever we talked to Phil Ang, you would see him in that control room, um, mm-hmm. you know, over there on the island. And, you know, you just somewhat of a reassurance, you know, when you when you know the person, uh, not just the name. So I'm sure the riders who saw you that day uh, were glad that you were braving the elements, uh, you and your team, um, mm-hmm. you know, to, to hear their thoughts, um, you know, and their concerns. Uh, okay. And lastly, I just know, um, again, in terms of what we mentioned here, uh, progress on some of those major projects. Uh, it looks like the Garden City Denton Ave Bridge that was just completed as well. Yeah, so. just last weekend. It's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, right, right nearby here to the campus. I know yep. a lot of folks, uh, of mm-hmm. course, use you know those stations. So just uh, you know, do we seem to be uh, again not to use the same pun, but on track? You know, with with, yeah. with where, where we are and, and where we're going with these projects. Yeah. So the expectation is that the third track project is going to be complete later this year. You know, this is a, this is a. Uh, Another place where we have to ask the patients for our customers because there's going to be a lot of work that has to happen over the summer between now and the end, between now and the fall. Right. Um, but that, that you know, to use your pun again, is on track, and that's going to be a very exciting project for Long Island. Uh, and then the East Side Access Project, I, you know, Chairman Lieber has said, you know, on any number of occasions, you know, his his goal is to get that done by the end of this year. Uh, so that's, I mean, those two projects are just going to completely, these are two historic projects for Long Island yeah, Health yeah, Service. Yeah. Um, so, wow. you know, it's just going to revolutionize, uh, you know, and provide so many opportunities for our customers to travel yeah. uh, differently yeah. than they're traveling now. So it's very exciting. Yeah. Yep, I, you know, I, used to be, to I used to be in the construction it. industry, and I remember seeing things for the East Side Access Project for probably the last 20 years. Yeah, it's that been a while. That they've yeah. been working on it for so long. And, you know, I was stunned. The Second uh, Avenue subway I didn't realize that there was still enough room down there to build a tunnel that big, that long, <laughs> and put a train in it. You know, yeah. it's like they keep putting things underground. It's like, where does it end? Sandhogs you know? will figure it out somehow, I guess. Absolutely. Who, who knew? But listen, we but, really want to thank you for uh, for joining us today and spending some time with us uh, answering some of these questions. Cause yeah, absolutely. We see the trains all the time. You, not so much. <laughs> so, right, so, so can I can I use this last like minute and a half to put a plug in for? Please, uh, for yeah. We we had a job fair at Nassau Community College, and we are just like hiring all over the place. We've got tons Great. of job postings. Any Nassau Community College student who's listening to this, check our website. We're looking for all kinds of people to work for the Long Island Railroad, the MTA. You know, everybody's out there looking for a job. You know, think about the MTA or Long Island Railroad as a place to come to work. We've got great yep. opportunities there. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Get a That's union uh, job, get a pension, you know, work in administration. It, it sounds like a great uh, place to work. So certainly uh, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your service. And uh, we look forward to hopefully speaking with you again in the, in the future and wish you all the best. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Be well. Yep. Thank Take you. Care. Have Bye. a great weekend. Take Thank care. You too. And now we're very happy to be joined for the first time by Newsday's Serena Trangle, who covers affordability and cost of living issues, as well as other business topics on Long Island. We re- really want to thank you for being with us. I know you're probably in the middle of writing a couple of stories and you take the time out to come and talk to us, which is great. Um, so we've we've been interested in um, a lot of the articles, and your subject matter has a lot of Long Islanders interested, in, and and oftentimes it feels like nothing is happening with it until maybe you write a story and they go, oh, there is something happening with it. You know, um, can you tell us where where we're kind of at with the idea of? Um, I guess it's uh, the question is really the recreational marijuana and whether or not that's ever going to be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Mm. Thank you again. And uh, I know we've gone from medical marijuana, uh, the passing of the MRTA, and now it's the actual enactment uh, phase. So, yeah, like I said, thank you. And if you could lay out where we uh, are before we get to where we're going, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, yes, it, there was some delays with um, the initial plan for implementation of recreational marijuana, um, just with the former governor resigning and sort of appointments to the regulatory board that is overseeing this process. But um, they've recently been pretty busy. Um, the big picture plan is that this month, Um, The state will be putting forward um, proposed regulations for all different types of licenses for this industry. Then there will be a public comment period. There might be some revisions and they hope to start taking applications for those licenses and get businesses licensed and ready to start work um, in early 2023. However, the state has also recently taken a few steps to jumpstart things and um, issued a issued and considered issuing two types of conditional or sort of interim licenses. Um, so they have issued uh, these inter- uh, these um, 
conditional licenses to some farmers to start cultivating uh, cannabis on Long Island. And they are have um, released a proposal to issue a conditional license for retailers. So um, those businesses, the farmers can get started soon and the retailers, when and if that happens as planned, could get started before the end of the year as well. Okay. And uh, the point, I know you toured some of those uh, locations and you kind of saw the uh you know, kind of uh, vastness and the uh, all that goes into that process on a daily basis. But uh, just to clarify, those farms, um, were they the ones who were initially hemp farms? I know there was a policy that uh, basically allowed certainly uh, the hemp farms particularly to start the process because I think it was attached to some funding and some other matters. So uh, is that the case? Yes, that is the case. Um, currently, right now, I'm only aware of one company that is cultivating cannabis, and that is Columbia Care, and that's a medical marijuana company. So obviously, medical mm-hmm. marijuana was legalized first. Yep. Um, and then very recently, in the last month and yesterday, the um, state regulators have approved conditional licenses for four other um, agricultural firms, all in Suffolk. And um, to get this conditional license, you need to have experience having grown hemp. Um, and I think that's just because it's it's a similar plant and the state um, believes these people already have experience and know what they're doing and they, they already have some sort of regulatory relationship with them. Uh, the conditional license is really an effort to get things going promptly. So I think there will be... Um, you know, obviously there will be a different, more longer term license, but initially, yes, it is exclusively open to people who have experience uh, growing hemp. Hmm. Okay. And that's separate from the conditional licenses that would be re- rendered for folks who have experienced some type of uh, incarceration related to marijuana offenses, correct? Yeah. So right now there's just two licenses. Well, there's just one license that's, you know, people can actually apply for, which is the conditional cultivation license. And there's um, sort of a proposal for a second conditional um, retail dispensary license. That conditional license is limited to um, people who have experience successfully running a business for two years and have a marijuana related conviction or are related to somebody with a mar- marijuana related conviction. There's also some um, possibility that nonprofits could get this license if they work with people getting vocational training. Um, I think that's all. I haven't really seen anybody pursue that at this point. Um, but uh, separate from these conditional licenses, when the state issues its plan for more long term licenses, there will be prioritization for all types of licenses for people who, you know, have um, marijuana convictions are related to somebody with marijuana convictions are from a community where there were higher arrest rates for uh, marijuana offenses for minority and women owned businesses veterans who are disabled in service, as well as distressed farmers. So there is a lot of prioritization that will um, be factored into things long term as well. And uh, OK, and, hmm. you know, a- another big aspect of this, because it gets confusing because we see in the news locally here is that the counties, local municipalities have you know engaged in opting out of uh, participating in the recreational uh, at least sales of marijuana. Obviously, the other aspects of the uh, state law still apply. But in terms of the actual sale, uh, where do we stand? Um, I know there's been some changeover, at least in Nassau County, you know, with the uh, county executive, um, obviously some shuffling throughout the other town governments. But for the most part, are we still where we were? Uh, I know they have an opportunity to still opt back in, but a lot of them I don't believe have yet. Right. You know, I will be upfront in saying that I haven't tracked this day to day. So there could be some changes. But a few months ago, when I looked at this, everybody in NASA had opted out. And in Suffolk County, four towns had opted in. And within those towns, a number of smaller localities had opted out. So it was Hmm. pretty narrow. Um, At any point in time, a government could decide to opt back in. And I would just emphasize that the opt outs only apply to um, dispensaries or consumption sites. So anybody who lives there could still order delivery. Um, it could mm. still consume, you know, cannabis uh, privately in their own time and space or buy it in Queens or whatever and, and drive back home. Right. Yeah, which is part of the concern, I know, for some folks who were saying even if they don't support necessarily marijuana, it's the loss of revenue, uh, just like on alcohol. If you have to have somebody go to a beer distributor in you know, Queens County, you know, it's not putting money, sales tax back in you know, Nassau County. So, mm-hmm. OK, that's interesting. Well, you um, know, we were talking about the opt out mm-hmm. thing and and. Uh, you know, we realize a, a little bit into it that, well, it's just a frugal approach. 
uh, because people who opted out can opt back in eventually is what we understand. But if you've opted in, you can't opt out. So if you're running a town, it's not a, you know, it's not a stupid thing to do. It's, you know, everybody's just taking a few (laughs) steps. And I think from my uneducated position to say that uh, most are going to be looking at what they're going to realize as far as financial gain for either a town or a village, you know, people throwing out numbers. Oh, we're going to, we're going to make a billion dollars or we're going to make, you know, and so nobody really knows. Although we do have some States in the middle of the country where they can get numbers and get something, um, concrete. So that, is that me? Yeah, of course. And building off of, uh, you know, some of the issues that maybe other States may have had, um, knowing specifically, like you said, around, maybe not uh, having enough MWBEs and, you know, veteran operated businesses. Right. It was more, uh, again, an issue specifically, you know, that was kind of folks maybe in, in, in the, we'll say finance world and, you know, kind of already had connections to business. Um, that's something I know that the state was trying to particularly uh, somewhat circumvent here, but, um, you know, maybe transitioning in, in, into some of your other points of your stories, um, you know, in terms of the actual logistics, how these places are being operated, um, like you said, Columbia Care, I know, um, you know, Newsday uh, went out there and you know, talked about all the, the, the ladybugs they have to use and uh, all these other types of things that you don't really think about, um, you know, what farmers do, of course, regardless of the crop. So, you know, mm. wh- what do we see, um, you know, in terms of these businesses? Uh, you know, how are they starting to operate, I guess, uh, the ones that are or the one that is? <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, that was a really fun story for me. I am not uh, super familiar with many parts of the agricultural you know, industry. So it was uh, really interesting. So I guess, you know, when I went out to Columbia Care's facility, um, you know, they, they have you put on sort of a, a medical type of gown and booties and everything. They're very concerned about contaminants in their um, facility. And they even have um, sort of you know, people who work there have to wear their street clothes outside and then their work clothes inside and different shoes. And they have these mats where you step on to, uh, there's some sort of antibacterial solution that you step on every time you leave a certain room just to make sure you're not tracking or bringing anything in. Um, And it was just, um, you know, very uh, meticulous. You know, everything is, uh, they have dates everywhere. Everything is measured out for how long things have been certain places. Um, you know, very, a lot of measurements. There are, um, as John mentioned, there's like a whole army of bugs that are released and used to prevent very small pests from interfering with the crop. Uh, There's a very intricate process of drying out the um, flower of the cannabis, which is the part that contains THC that produces a high, um, you know, where it's, dried out, hanging upside down. It then has to be burped, which is sort of um, periodically exposed to air. There's a, there's a very intricate process for um, getting the right amount of moisture out. I guess if it's too dry, it's not smokable. Mm -hmm. If it's too wet, obviously it could be moldy. Um, And then they have to put it through an x-ray machine to purify it. Um, And ultimately after all of this, after it's, you know, packaged in tubs, 10 samples are sent to an outside lab not affiliated with the company to um, make sure everything with the product is okay, as well as measure the levels of THC and CBD, um, at which point they can print a label with that information on it and, you know, get it out to um, dispensaries or other retailers. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That's obviously an important factor. Um, You know, the idea of having a legal market versus a illegal, you know, black market is the idea of consistency and control of the product like alcohol. Um, you know, you don't want to see what happens in other parts or in the past where people try to bootleg alcohol and they go blind. Uh, Bath, bathtub of, gin. Know. Yeah, bathtub gin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, that, that's another point of, uh, of interest. And, and I know you make it sound almost uh, like a NASA-esque, you know, kind of style of, uh, you know, kind of containment and quality yeah. control and all that. Uh, but but how do the, the traditional farmers kind of feel uh, out in that area, maybe where they're operating as well? Because, you know, this seems to be more probably right indoors and hydroponic or something like that versus... Uh, A lot of maybe, you know, kind of soil and dirt, you know, maybe, I don't know, carrot and, uh, you know, whatever type of vegetable farmers out there. Potatoes. Yeah, definitely potatoes. Uh, Are they, do they seem to be open or is it kind of like, hey, who's this new guy on the block that's doing things, you know, technically farming, but very differently than us? Mm. Um, You know, I've only spoken to two farmers who recently received the um, conditional cultivation license. So, um, 
I don't know for sure sort of how things will play out, but one of them was planning to grow some outside and some inside, and one was planning to grow outside. I think it takes um, more investment to have a greenhouse, um, and that can obviously allow you to grow year-round and potentially increase your profit and tends to increase your um, quality as well and just sort of... um, I guess, extra protection if there's some sort of extreme weather event. Um, so I don't know for sure how, how things will play out in that respect. I know that the state is taking a lot of steps to try to um, promote smaller, you know, promote smaller farmers and smaller businesses being able to be involved in um, this industry. Uh, when I initially started reporting on this, I got the impression that people didn't expect a huge amount of farming on Long Island because Um, people anticipated that, you know, to make more money and to remain profitable, you'd want a larger operation in a greenhouse and the cost of water and electricity on Long Island is significantly Mm -hmm. higher than upstate. So people kind of thought you would see a lot of the cultivation and processing upstate. I don't know, you know, how much that will bear out. I think we'll just have to see. Of course, of course. Um, So (laughs) fair enough. And, uh, you know, like I said, there's a a farming community that's always been here on Long Island, uh, but, you know, it's a matter of you know, the Long Island Farm Bureau, I'm sure other folks, you know, trying to support anyone who's, you know, trying to operate. I know there's always been a push to get younger farmers involved. And I would tend to think that a lot of the folks in this industry might be a little bit younger. But, you know, it's hard to say. I'm sure, you know, we'll see uh, folks of all different backgrounds and, uh, you know, kind of ages and everything else, uh, you know, fall into the, this industry. But maybe turning to a point uh, that you had raised uh, and I think was brought up in a uh, webinar from Newsday in terms of uh, the... Um, we'll say potency uh, of THC, uh, again, quantity in marijuana. I know that's something that, you know, for folks, you know, who think of maybe marijuana uh, pot from like the 70s, um, you know, are a little bit surprised to hear when you just see the data on, you know, where it's kind of come, maybe because of the designer nature of it and just the industry that's built up in that time, I guess, um, you know, in the gray market. So uh, what, what, what was said, I guess, and what was uh, the important takeaways of that webinar? Um, yes, I... Uh you're correct that marijuana is significantly more potent today than it was in the 70s. And um, the researcher who has a medical scientific background who was on that webinar uh, basically said that the marijuana that was common in the 70s is no longer around because just the proportion of THC has skyrocketed in cannabis since then. Um, and, you know, today there are products that isolate THC, um, that distill it down into an extract that can be um, vaped or smoked or, you know, cooked with or whatever, consumed in multiple other ways. Um, so that is correct. It is um, much more potent. I, you know, am in my 30s, so I don't know that I have you know, any insight into what things were like in the 70s. But I guess the gist of it is that if you're an older person who is um, going to or consume Mm -hmm. cannabis today, be mindful that it might be different and start with a smaller dose and just be mindful of that and careful of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's, uh, it's interesting that, um, and of course, I had a question for you, and now I can't think of what it was. But that's my uh, that's my that's my world. Um, yeah, we won't say that there's any uh, <laughs> uh, any connection to the story matter at hand. Uh, yeah. But point yeah. being is that yeah, like I said, there's a lot of discussion. You know, I know a lot of the concerns were raised around uh, the marketing of these products to mm-hmm. children. Uh, I know that that raised a lot of issues. Um, I remember some state senators on Long Island, you know, talking about different products that look like consumer products. Um, you know, ha- has any of that, um, you know? From, from, I guess, your reporting uh, kind of, you know, been an issue that seems to be a continued barrier, or is that something that maybe is starting to fade away, or I guess the, the and I, I believe actually in New Jersey, where they're not able to sell, I think, edibles, I think they're only able to sell, um, you know, other types of products. Is that a possibility here, or at this point, it still seems open to all of the marijuana products in the recreational space? I haven't heard any, I mean, I haven't specifically looked into what's happening in New Jersey, but I have not heard anything that um, suggest that the New York state is going to limit, um, edibles or products that might be more appealing to children. I know they had PSAs and publicity campaigns aimed at, um, encouraging people to safely store marijuana, encouraging people to talk with younger people about the risks of consuming marijuana. Um, you know, yes, people have concerns about, um, 
you know, younger people having access to cannabis and um, publicity materials. I don't know that the industry is, you know, alive enough to kind of see what will happen with that. But I am not aware of any proposals to limit the types of products available at this point. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, I'm not sure if Bill, uh, you know, came upon the question he was going to ask or has another one, but I, I guess otherwise, just in terms of, you know, your reporting, what, what are the other major uh, takeaways in the final uh, moments that we have here with you today uh, in terms of what you reported and, you know, what you think you will be reporting on, uh, you know, going forward, uh, you know, in the near future on this matter? Um, you know, I think that I'm really watching for licensing fees and how much licensing fees are and how many applications um, the state gets and grants. Um, they, they aren't planning to cap the number of licenses they issue. However, I think access to financing will be a barrier mm. or potentially could be a barrier. So I know for the two licenses, uh, the one that is available now and the one that they're sort of have preliminary regulations for the licensing fee is $2,000. Um, and that's non-refundable if you don't get it. So I'm just kind of uh -huh. looking at um, access to entry, how much support there might be for um, what the state considers to be social equity candidates, um, as well as just sort of the finances of it and how people will operate a business that um, may not be able to or will really be unlikely to access traditional financial institutions. Right. Um, so you know if it, has there been any change about that uh, as far as banks, uh, you know, being able to set up some kind of a, a, a thing for, let's say, growers or whatever to, to deal with the cash? Is that still a federal matter or, or is the state able to even do oh, anything on that? I know that's always been a question, right? I think the state is looking into um, taking some steps. I don't think they can, you know, I mean, the most banks are overseen by the federal government. I, this is actually something I want to look into. So I don't want to, you right. know, say anything without having reported through really what's going on, but mm -hmm. I know that's a big concern. And um, you, I believe credit unions are one potential um, alternative for people, but I think the state is also looking at other ways they might be able to help businesses in that respect. And I'm, I'm really curious about um, how that will all shake out. Yeah. Oh yeah. The uh, Office of Cannabis uh, Management, uh, I'm sure they have a lot of uh, things to figure out uh, in the time being. I know they're having these kind of uh, online sessions where people can figure it out. I just saw an advertisement, I believe it's uh, Queens College and I believe SUNY either Farmingdale or Suffolk State. They're having like a two-day course on how to get involved into this industry if someone's, uh, you know, would want to. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting. I know a lot of folks, you know, even the Cornell and uh, the agricultural space, like you said, are trying to you know, build a pipeline uh, for people to have this be a legitimate industry. So we certainly uh, will look forward to you reporting on it and your other colleagues in terms of the developments uh, on this yeah, issue. Yeah. There seem to be, there seem, excuse me, there, there, there seem to be a lot of players in that. Now, I, I guess New York State, uh, if they're going to issue licenses and things, they, you know, because we've spoken to some lawmakers who, uh, one in particular, and I won't even mention the name, but they, they're going to use zoning to determine where, um, recreational pot shops can be put um, something about industrial areas and of course nowhere near a school nowhere near a church nowhere near uh, um, so it had nothing to do with anything other than they had control over the zoning um, will will something like that affect New York State's uh, you know exchange with these people who want to get into the business I mean, are things like that a, a blockade or an issue? You yes, know? they are. <laughs> okay. I, I don't, I mean, I guess the first barrier is, um, it, I mean, if you want to be a, re if you want to be a retailer or a consumption site, like a bar or a shop, um, mm. yeah, you can't operate in a municipality that is opting out of allowing those types of businesses. Okay. And then for those that are, are opting in, um, there could still be zoning hurdles. Um, there are businesses that, you know, want to get started now or soon, as soon as they can, so that they can establish themselves um, mm. before, you know, the industry gets saturated. And those people may look to other locations. I've, I have met one woman who has done that or is in the process of doing that. So, yes, it, I, I mean, I don't know for sure how big of a barrier it will be, but it, it will be a barrier. Yes. Yeah, right. right. Oh, so, I mean, they can go to the state and they can get an OK and all that, but there still may be things down the line when they attempt to uh, make it a reality that they could run into. If they opt in, like you said, the local municipality. Well, and there's a, that's a whole yeah. other thing, yeah. So yeah, it, it, I don't, I mean, they haven't issued 
uh, the actual like license paperwork, even for the conditional license yet. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, but I have a sense that where you plan to locate will need to be sort of hashed out as you're applying. So right. I don't think the state's going to give you a license in a location that has opted out or in a location uh-huh. that is, you know, near a house of worship or a school or something. Right. You know, I think that will be ironed out before you get a license. So I, I don't know that people will get so far that they're, um, you know, right. in the position you described, but nonetheless, yes, there will be various hurdles. Yeah. Okay. Do you have and, a guess uh, on a timeline? Do you have a like a guess? Or, or do they have anything firm in terms of they have to meet like an, a certain date uh, for this to be? I, I don't know if that's actually that's not a, a firm thing, right? I don't think so. In fact, they had missed many of the dates that were initially <laughs> planned because of um, you know everything going on with. Uh, political leadership change in Albany. Um, mm. But like I said, I think this month is when they had planned to release um, proposals for all types of licenses. And then there will be a public comment period and they hope to have the licenses open and available for applicants by the end of this calendar year. Um, so, you know, things should be getting even busier in the coming months. Okay, so a lot to keep you uh, occupied on that beat. Uh, well, but also, we do want to mention that you do cover uh, other, you know, uh, Long Island related stories. I know you had a, an ex- uh, exclusive watchdog uh, piece uh, on federal pandemic relief. Um, it looks like one town didn't spend it all, one spent it all, and needed to find a new way to uh, try to fund, uh, I guess, what, what people were still applying for through maybe administrative costs. So um, I don't know if you have any other, you know, kind of stories like that um, in the works right now, but uh, we certainly encourage everyone to. Follow, subscribe to Newsday, uh, follow, obviously, uh, Serena and uh, on social media and obviously uh, wherever she's reporting on these important issues. Thanks for having me. We'll look to you yep. to keep us posted. Have a great weekend and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Take care. Take care. Yep, see you. And just a reminder, you're listening to 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College in Garden City, New York. I'm Bill McIntyre. I was here with John Gallo. Uh, we had some really good guests on. We had uh, Catherine Rinaldi today, which is uh, very interesting about the uh, railroad situation. Um, and of course, the one driving question in everyone's mind was, is she getting paid for both jobs? And she assured us she is not. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, I mean, those are two very high profile positions. Um, in any event, there's uh, some other stories here in uh, Newsday today. Um, And one that interests me, being a a longtime union guy from years ago, a Massapequa Starbucks has become the first on Long Island to unionize following a successful vote in favor of organizing the local coffee shop on Tuesday. With a final count of 19 to 8 in favor, employees at the store located at the Massapequa Village Square at 4301 Merrick Road have voted to join the Workers United New York New Jersey Regional Board, an affiliate of the Service Employees International Union. Baristas at Great Neck location, which also had their union votes tallied Tuesday, voted against unionizing 6 to 5. Organizers at the 6 Great Neck Road Starbucks were the first on the island to petition for a union vote earlier this year. It says we are listening and learning from the partners in these stores as we always do across the country. A Starbucks spokesperson said in a statement following the vote counts at National Labor Relations Board offices in Brooklyn, we've been clear in our belief that we are better together as partners without a union between us and that conviction has not changed. Well, we respect our partners' rights to organize and are committed to following the National Labor Relations Board process. Um, I mean, we've seen it in the last couple of uh, couple of weeks, um, union activity all over the country. Um, but Tony Ann Buscemi, 25, a barista and a union organizer at the Massapequa location, said the victory there has given her and her co-workers a sense of optimism about their futures with the global coffee giant. We're all very excited, said Buscemi, a Massapequa resident who started working there two years ago. We just wanted to have a say in our workplace, she said. Well, beyond Starbucks, I hope that we inspire more workers everywhere to unionize. A spokeswoman for Workers United, Leanne Tory Murphy, said the union would be challenging the outcome of the unsuccessful vote in Great Neck. It has filed 22 unfair labor practice allegations against Starbucks management at that store. 
I'm disappointed for sure, said Justin Worcester, 22, one of the organizers in Great Neck. Worcester, a Great Neck resident and former barista at the shop, asserted that union busting was off the charts at the store and likely contributed to the rejection. Starbucks spokeswoman Sarah Albanese in March called such accusations completely false. Worcester left his job at the Starbucks last month but had remained active in the union drive, pushing for the store's unionization. And even though we lost, we still started this kind of revolution within Long Island, he said. At the end of the day, I'm thrilled that we were able to inspire people to fight for change, and we're not done fighting. So in more of the story, the Great Neck and Massapequa employees, along with those at a location in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, began mail-in voting in early April. The Bensonhurst workers approved the union on a 17-0 vote announced on Tuesday. Today is truly historic. After months of courageous organizing from the partners at the Massapequa Starbucks, Long Island officially has its first unionized Starbucks location. John R. Durso, president of the Long Island Federation of Labor, said in a statement Tuesday, The entire Long Island union movement is so proud to welcome these workers into our union family. More than 250 Starbucks stores across the country have begun publicly pushing for union votes since workers at two Buffalo stores successfully unionized late last year, a statement from Workers United said. The efforts have succeeded at more than 50 stores, according to the union. Two other stores on the island, one in Westbury and another in Farmingville, submitted signed union cards last month with the National Labor Relations Board to secure a future union vote. Timelines for voting on those two stores have not been set. Now, to me, that's a big story um, because I, I personally believe that unions need to make a comeback or the middle class is really not going to have much of a, much of a shot. Um, collective bargaining is the only way to go. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's companies out there who treat their employees very well and, and they would probably not want to go for a union. But on the other hand, I'm sure the number is larger for people who would like some collective bargaining uh, ability. Um, so anyway, well, of that's, course. you know. And, um, yeah, Bill, I know, obviously, you have a lot of experience, like you said, obviously, uh, being a, a, a shop uh, steward, I believe, right? Uh, mm-hmm. CWA in your past lives. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, which you have many of. Uh, but, yeah. but, yeah, of course. And, and, and this isn't in a vacuum, um, knowing that, you know, the Amazon uh, unionization movement in particular uh, you know, has gotten a lot of uh, press attention in terms of um, seeing, you know, that one specific location did successfully uh, pass a vote uh, to unionize. The other location uh, did not. Uh, but that also comes on the heels of last fall. John Deere, uh, Kellogg's, uh, I believe a, a bunch of other, uh, you know, large companies where they faced unionization drives, although um, some less successful, um, others, you know, not really to form a union, but to get better, um, you know, kind of terms of employment. So, yeah. you know, what, what are your thoughts just seeing, again, you know, kind of the revitalization? And I know even the president just had, um, again, the leader of the Amazon union and a bunch of other folks on Capitol Hill, I believe, yesterday, right. uh, discussing on why they're going to be so full-fledgedly supporting that right now. Yeah, well, you know, I think the little guy needs an advocate. It's it's kind of analogous to the idea of going to a hospital today. Most people who have just had a hospital experience will tell you that you need an advocate in a hospital. Don't go by yourself. Make sure there's somebody who can run out in the hallway and grab a doctor or go down to the nurse's desk and ask a question. Otherwise, you're stuck in a room and you never know what's, you know, what could happen. Anyway, um, so the, the union thing, I think, is, uh, you know... It's a, it's the same idea. Uh, people need to learn about w- w- what unions did. You know, people go to work today and they don't realize that their work uh, environment was dictated and and was fought for. Um, you know, some of the the rules just go back to you know a few decades, and you, you see what the uh, what workers had to put up with in those days. Um, we get Saturday and Sunday off. Workers. People died, <laughs> so that could happen. I mean, some of the stories, if you go back and read about Mother Jones and the West Virginia miners and what she did 
and what the company oh, yeah. was doing Blair to them. Mountain. Yep, that whole idea of, you know, company money. And uh, you lived in a company house. You bought your food from a company store. So basically you got your paycheck on a Friday and you turned it back over to the company because you've been living in their housing and eating their food. Um, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a you know, very um, kind of vast and, you know, historically important, you know, concept, the idea of, um, you know, labor uh, organizing, um, you know, <laughs> don't want to go all the way back to the feudal days, but yeah. you know, knowing that, again, you know, that's kind of the roots of, uh, you know, yeah. do you have a right to your own time? Do you have a right to, you know, uh, certain things um, that you believe are, in a sense, unalienable, uh, uh. like health care, potentially, like, uh, you know, safety, uh, of course, along the way. So th- there's a lot of other aspects of this, you know, that kind of are at play besides just the, you know, in the moment um, situation. But it is yeah. interesting to see, you know, I am close to that great neck um, and, and frequented, oh. you know, uh, relatively. To mm-hmm. be honest, I'm not really the biggest Starbucks guy, but if I am, that's the, one of the closest ones to me. Um, and, and knowing that they were involved and seeing a bunch of folks come support them, it, it certainly was interesting. And I'm sure you saw the same thing out in Massapequa. Um, you know, I know I went up to university at Buffalo and did undergrad up there. And, uh, I know those two locations quite well. I definitely had friends, you know, when you're in college who worked at Starbucks and the right. days up there. It's interesting to see, you know, kind of New York and particularly, you know, the Long Island region, uh, obviously the city too is involved, but, uh, and also in particularly Buffalo, New York, uh, which is one of those right. rust belt cities that was built on, you know, steel, uh, mm-hmm. labor and, and other industries that, you know, certainly, are not there yeah, right, <laughs> not the right. same way that they were in the past. Yeah, so, I, th- I think an, in- an interesting thing about the uh, the Amazon thing, though, was that the guy mm-hmm. that actually did the organizing, um, I-, I mean, w- you know, what tools did he have? He was passing notes during uh, lunch, uh, you know, that's yeah. what he, and Amazon, I mean, I, I read it in one of the articles, spent something like $43 million to stop that from happening. Um, with people that yeah, they hired to go out on the just, floor and act as workers and, and act as, you know, uh, to try to change the mindset of the employees there or whatever. And this this guy was just, uh, you know, it was really something. $43 million. Well, it certainly, it certainly was grassroots, it seems, yeah. um, you know, and knowing that as opposed to some of the other locations, which did have more uh, traditional, you know, kind of uh, labor support uh, behind it, whether it's, you know, retail, commercial uh, food workers, et cetera, mm. um, where they weren't as successful um, as, as this specific incident. But, you know, we do have yeah. to keep in mind that I think there's a big reason why they were up at the Capitol, um, the, you know, U.S. Capitol yesterday was that it looks like, you know, Amazon is still going to, uh, you know, kind of challenge the uh, vote and the decision. They're starting to, or they're claiming that the uh, National Labor Review Board was basically biased and uh in 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 oh, the, the kind of uh, support right. uh, yeah and the decision process here so we'll see you know right. the, poor, big I, news. the poor corporation yeah. needs help right <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, but it's complicated because yeah. we, we have a lot of conflicted consumers you know who use amazon on a regular basis but don't really think about you know necessarily how things get there you know yeah. we're more attached uh, the more we go from you know food supply chain product supply chain etc so it's a different world it's be interesting yeah it's a different yeah. world Anyway, but I some think things the, are the same. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. So, um, good stuff. But I think the clock on the wall says it's time for this week's Long Island News to move on out of here. We thank you for joining us. Remind you, you can catch this week's Long Island News every Friday at 3 p.m. right here on 90.3 WHPC.